cooling begins. Let's say you've got a condensing temperature of 120 degrees. I just, just about need another marker here. 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Say you've got an R22 system. Um, so, what is our pressure? Anybody have a pressure temperature chart? Here's one right here. We've got a 120 degree condensing temperature. Let's find R22. That corresponds to a head pressure of 260 psig. Um, what does that mean? That means at that pressure, you put your gauges on, you read your high side pressure, 260 psig. You convert that to temperature. Um, that's a temperature of 120 degrees. That is the point in the condenser where all your refrigerant is 100% liquid. And from that point on, your subcooling begins. All right, you got 120 degree um, liquid. Let's say your ambient temperature is 90, 95 degrees. So you've still got a temperature di differential, right? Yes. So additional heat from that liquid is going to be given up to that 95 degree air blowing across that condenser. <coughs> That's your subcooling. All right, where do you measure your subcooling at? What's, what's the point in the system where you measure your subcooling? You measure at your liquid line near your metering device, if possible. All right, let's say your liquid line is 105 degrees. What's your subcooling here? 15 degrees. And that is a common subcooling. Uh, of course, there's no one size fits all, but as a general rule, your subcooling is going to range anywhere from 10 to 20 degrees, somewhere in there. So, uh, that subcooling is really important, uh, liquid subcooling. If you don't know the definition of liquid subcooling by now, you should. Why is it important? Number one, it ensures you've got 100% liquid entering your metering device. Number two, it's an indication of uh, how good a job your condenser is doing. Now, if you've got a, a really high subcooling, that's an indication of an overcharge. You've got too much refrigerant in the system and it's building up in the condenser. It's using the condenser as a liquid receiver. If you've got a low subcooling or no subcooling, that's an indication of condenser problems. Uh, if you don't have any subcooling, you may not have 100% liquid entering your metering device, and your, your evaporator is going to be starved immediately. So that's why <coughs> subcooling is important. Now, subcooling occurs in the condenser, and it's something that we can measure. Take your set of gauges, attach your gauges to the system, read your discharge pressure, your head pressure, convert it to temperature for that particular refrigerant. Measure the temperature of your liquid line near your metering device and subtract the lower number from the higher number and that is your um, system subcooling. Subcooling, very important measurement. <coughs> Again, um, regarding condensers, you know, regardless what type of condenser it is, <coughs> Air coil or water coil or a commercial type condensing unit or even a static condenser. What's a static condenser? Uh, have you all seen these refrigerators? It's got a, a coil of tubing on the back and no fan. That's a static condenser. It uses natural draft or it just uses natural convection to get rid of the heat out of the refrigerant vapor. So if you see one of those old refrigerators or freezers with that coil on the back, that's a static condenser. You know, it doesn't have forced air blowing air across the condenser. Any questions about condensers? So that heat on that old static condenser, that means it's just going back into the room. Right, it's just going back into the room. 
Yeah, in fact, <laughs> you know, when you do the load calculations, uh, you know, you, you have to allow so many BTU of heat added to the structure, especially in the kitchen area, because the, the appliances, you know, they give off heat. A refrigerator, even though it's cooling on the inside, where does that heat go? The heat it removes on the inside of that refrigerator, it goes in your kitchen. <laughs> so yes, it does reject heat. Could, the condenser temperature, let's say 120, you get that from imaging with your infrared light and you hold over your condenser, how would you go about getting that particular measure? You have to put your gauges on and convert it to temperature. Okay. I'll tell you a little secret. When I put gauges on a unit and I look at that pressure, I always see temperature in my mind. Always, because, you know, one without the other on a refrigeration system is not going to do you a whole lot of good. You, you need to know what that corresponding temperature is. That's always been somewhat of a mystery to me, but it's, a, it's intriguing, it's, it's interesting how that, that refrigerant, the pressure corresponds to a certain temperature and the temperature corresponds to a certain pressure. That's always been interesting to me and it's been intriguing. Um, when you're evaluating a refrigeration system, you need to know the system pressures. You need to convert those pressures to temperature, you need to measure your subcooling, and you need to measure your superheat. Now we're going to talk about evaporators. Uh, what does the evaporator do inside the system? Any, anybody? Anybody want to jump in there and get a saw heat? That's exactly right. Uh, I know uh, one place in the text it talks about how that uh, a refrigeration system is, is like a, a sponge, with the sponge being the evaporator. You take, the, you take a dry sponge, you immerse it in a container of water, depending on how much water, depending on how big the sponge is, it'll absorb almost all of that water. And then you take the, the sponge and then you squeeze it out. The sponge is the evaporator, it absorbs heat. The sponge absorbs the water. Uh, and then you come over here and the condenser squeezes that water you know, out of the sponge. So you're absorbing, rejecting, absorbing, rejecting. Condenser rejects heat, the evaporator absorbs heat. <laughs> now, uh, the evaporator coil, just like the condenser coil, comes in all shapes and sizes. Uh, this is a typical uh, refrigeration evaporator coil. You notice how wide the fins are on this coil? There's a purpose for that. Uh, this is a medium low temperature coil and it's going to naturally frost up because the evaporator temperature operates below freezing. Uh, and any time in a low medium temperature application, you're going to have frost buildup and ice buildup on the coil. They have to have a means of defrost. Uh, on an air conditioner coil, which is um, um, Typically, an, an air conditioning system is a high temperature refrigeration system. And, and that goes back, I don't mean to be bouncing around, but do you all remember when we talked about uh, low temperature systems and then medium temperature systems and high temperature systems? All right, we're talking about refrigeration systems. Low temperature, you've got space temperatures below freezing, a freezer. Um, is a low temperature system. Your refrigerator at home is actually, the evaporator is a low temperature system. Medium temperature, space temperature is just above freezing, 35 degrees. You know, your supermarket refrigeration, your dairy coolers, your fresh meat coolers, your fresh vegetable coolers. High temperature, air conditioning. Uh, air conditioning, most of your evaporator coils operate uh, at somewhere around 40 to 45 degrees. Your medium temperature um, evaporators typically operate somewhere um, you know, around 15 to 25 degrees Fahrenheit. Your low temperature evaporator coils, uh, it's not unusual for, for them to operate below freezing, somewhere around 15 degrees below zero. Um, again, another rule of thumb in refrigeration, you can, you can say that typically your evaporator operating temperature is going to be somewhere around 10 to 15 degrees um, colder than your space temperature. It has to be or no heat transfer will occur. Your evaporator has got to be colder than your space temperature if you want it to absorb heat. Let's say you have a space temperature of um, 30 degrees and an evaporator coil temperature of 30 degrees. Is any heat transfer going to take place? No, 
you've got to have a colder evaporator coil than the, the air blowing across it or the refrigerator is not going to absorb any heat. It all goes back to the basic fundamentals. Heat always travels toward a cooler temperature. Um, again, the evaporators can come in all shapes and sizes. You've got stamped evaporators, plate evaporators, you've got water-cooled evaporators, uh, a water chiller. What's a water chiller? Uh, typically, it's a machine that instead of removing heat from air, it removes heat from water or uh, some type of, of liquid solution like glycol. You know, in these plants where they process meat or they process food or, you know, these refrigeration plants where they have large areas that, you know, uh, uh, maintain a 35 degree temperature or even colder, you know, in the 20s or even colder than that. Uh, they'll have a large machine that they call a chiller, uh, and that refrigeration machine uh, will remove heat from uh, a liquid, and then they'll pump that liquid throughout a series of coils. The liquid in the coil is colder than the air blowing across the coil, so you have a natural heat transfer that occurs. Uh, so that's, that's the process of refrigeration, removing heat from one place where it's not wanted, rejecting it into another place where it makes no difference. Uh, an ice machine, you got an ice machine, it's, uh, you know, you got different types of evaporator coils uh, and typically the, uh, the evaporator may be a mold where the water uh, actually flows across a certain mold and uh, the temperature of the evaporator is well 